We're going to be jumping into this message today, and it's called The Tale of Two Goats. The Tale of Two Goats. Now, full disclosure, I understand that the goats that are in front of me are both white goats, and the one on the sermon art is white and brown. I did that just for you people that everything has to be perfect, uh, just to bother you the entire time. So I'm just going to say it right now. I couldn't find a brown goat anywhere. It was really hard to find one. So use your imagination. When I talk about goat, I'm not talking about the greatest of all time, all right, which we know is Joe Montana. Amen, Dale? But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an actual goat. Now, full disclosure, I hate goats. <laughs> I do. You can't trust them. They're erratic. I like animals that you can trust. I like turtles. <laughs> I like fish. Goldfish. I don't like horses. Can't trust them. I don't like dogs. Can't trust them. I don't like cats because they don't like anybody. I don't like goats. In fact, I thought goats were really stupid animals. But apparently, after the rabbit hole of research I did this week, they're actually highly intelligent animals. Do you want to know why I don't like goats? Do you want to know why I don't like goats? Thank you. Because I have PTSD from one encounter with a goat. One when I was a kid. I was middle school, and my friend had a goat that just wandered his property. Now, for some of you that grew up in Westmoreland and other rural places, that's probably not that big of a deal and not that unusual, right? <laughs> yeah. And there's somebody here from Beth Page I met earlier, too, and they're like, oh, yeah, we got goats all over the place. Well, they walk into Walmart. They just whatever. But, <laughs> but I grew up in downtown Sacramento, so a goat wandering somebody's property is a little strange. And I went over to my friend's house, and his mom, her name was Janice, she said, I'm so glad you're here. I know this is your first time here. We only have one rule in this house. Don't let the goat get in the house. Okay, I walk outside. The very first time that that door is even open a crack, this goat comes blasting through the front door in the house. And I'm like, I'm never going to get invited back again. And, and you're going to think I'm making this up, Keith, but I promise you I'm not. This goat comes running in. And we'd been playing video games. Like, we had a session all night, all, all morning. It was about to be all night of, of Super Nintendo. Just came out with Super Mario Brothers. First time I had Yoshi. Some of y'all know nothing about that, but that's a big deal. And so we got one of those big, giant bags of popcorn, like the big old ones, right? Oh, no, is right. And so the goat runs in, steps in that bag of popcorn, starts freaking out. I never realized how much goats poop. It looked like you took a bag of, of brown little raisinets and just sprayed them everywhere, just sprinkled them. And so the, the goat's foot gets stuck in the popcorn bag. It poops because it's freaking out. It's kind of fainting, which is weird. And it runs around the house, and it looks like the Tasmanian devil had a popcorn fight there all over the place. Then... I don't know why it jumps up on the counter and starts scraping its hooves, knocking off dishes everywhere. And I'm standing here and Janice is standing over there and I just want to call my mom and go home. I never got invited back to their house, but because of that, I hate goats. So a while ago, as I was thinking about this message, that story has absolutely nothing to do with today's message, but I want to let you know that I decided to yield to the Holy Spirit's impression upon me to preach this message, despite how much I hate goats. I want to talk about these two goats and a tale of two goats, but, but rather than these two goats like having names, I want to give them a real name that you will remember. So bear with me for just a moment. Rather than this goat being named whatever you name a goat, I want to talk about the two different goats that you have in your life. And you may not even know that you have these goats in your life. This one is your spirit. And you church people that have grown up in church, I bet you can guess what this other one is. Go ahead, try to guess. So I heard a couple of answers. Unfortunately, none of them were right, but that's okay. We got work to do, Adam. Your spirit and your flesh. Now, these are weird words. 
We call these in the church Christianese. Because if you grew up in church, you're like, oh, duh, spirit and flesh. If this is your first time ever being in a church, you're like, what kind of church is this, bro? Is this vampires and cannibals? I want nothing to do with this place. And, but, but, but let me explain it for just a moment. So your spirit are things of God. They're not innate to you because you and I are born into sin. These things have to be acquired and developed. It's the things of God. Your flesh, you're born into. Your flesh is this inward desire for yourself and self-gratification that's instant, what you want right away. That's your flesh. You want a great example of spirit versus flesh. Go into a kindergarten class, open up a bag of M&Ms and say, who wants them? You're not going to see people act, act in the spirit. You're going to see act in the flesh. Pushing, crying, grabbing, that's your flesh. The things that you want, the things that are you and the things that you have to actively make decisions to not do because your spirit and your flesh are at odds. Now, Paul spends a ridiculous amount of time writing about this tug of war between these two goats your spirit and your flesh. And what I want to do today is there's two different sets of goats. This is set one, and I want to talk at the end about set two of two different things that you have in your life and how we can be equipped to have one defeat the other because they're at war for your soul. So we're going to be in two different portions of scripture. We're going to be in Galatians, and then we're followed by Romans, which are letters that Paul wrote to particular churches for a particular time. But I think that these are incredibly pertinent to today's day and age. And so I'm going to let the word of God set the table for what we're talking about today. And we're going to be in Galatians 5. And I'm going to read 16 through 25. If you don't have a Bible, totally okay. We'll have it up on the screen. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. One, one translation says they are at war so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you were led by the spirit, then you were not under law. Verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgy, and the like. Now, now pause for just a moment. I was reading this chapter once. This is, this is um, <laughs> I was reading this chapter once when I was a youth pastor. I was a, a high school youth pastor. And at the very end, I read all of these things, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. But I messed up the word the and I said I so I said and I like here at the church we have a phrase that says Jesus changes everything and I believe it but also in some instances one word changes everything so choose carefully what words you say but when we look at this phrase we think or this verse we all of the different sexual sins pop up because those are the ones that seem to be amplified or highlighted because they make for, you know, provocative conversations. And, and we are going to address those issues in just a moment. But I also don't want you to misunderstand this. These aren't ranked in descending order. These are all ranked of things of the flesh. So we highlight the sexual immorality, and it is important, but we tend to overlook things like fits of rage, which is anger, selfish ambition, hatred, and then the ones that church folk are very, very susceptible to. Dissensions, factions, sowing up discord amongst the brethren, talking trash, being judgmental. These are all things of the flesh, and they're at war because you cannot have things of the flesh and things of the spirit at the same time. One of them is taking over. Verse 22 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. For those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh and the passions and the desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Interesting thing here for you to notice. 
is that Paul tells us initially what are the things of the flesh. Then he gives us a list of fruits of the Spirit. Jesus all the time talked about what are the things that are fruit. What is fruit? By your fruits you shall know them. You know it's an orange tree because it produces fruits of the Spirit are non-negotiable. We get fruits of the Spirit and spiritual gifts mixed up. Spiritual gifts you have. And yes, they can be developed, but you have. I don't have the spiritual gift of leading people in worship and singing. I just don't. I could try, and they say it's a sweet sound in his ears, but not yours. But some, you know, administration or working with children or, or hospitality, these are all fruits of the, uh, these are all gifts. But fruits of the Spirit are non negotiable. This is evidence that you are a believer. And so all of these things that he lists, these are things that you should have in your life and I should have in my life if we are children of God. And the longer you walk with God, the more these fruits of the Spirit should grow. So I ask you, let's go back and look. You have peace in your life? You have gentleness, kindness, self-control? Self-control is the opposite of the flesh. So, I'm going to make this incredibly practical. If we have the Spirit in our life and we have things of the flesh... How do we make our spirit win? Because you're like, I get it. Now I feel like garbage. Thanks a lot, preacher. What do we do? Let me ask you this. Which one are you feeding? You like that? Good. They didn't. <laughs> it's a physiological fact. What you feed? Gross. What you pay attention to? Gets healthier. You got two plants in your house? Anybody here like a plant lady or a plant dude? Like you got the, the, yeah. Oh yeah, you, dude, you need to go to plant rehab, Aspen. <laughs> Find out what happens if you pay attention to one plant and you water it and you fertilize it and you read bedtime stories to it and you do all those things and the other one you just completely ignore. Find out which one gets healthier because here's a physiological fact. What you feed grows. And so here's what I want to ask you. Which one are you feeding? So if we could talk about this, the, the purity for just a moment, for a very, very long time, I could not keep the purity of my eyes and thoughts uh, uh, the way that God wanted me to. It was incredibly difficult for me. And I, would, when, and I would, would wrestle with this and struggle with this, and I so desperately wanted to be pure and have this victory over purity. But then every time that there was a moment where I was left with a decision, I would fail. And I'm like, why? Because I want to be pure with my thoughts, with what I'm looking at. But here's what I had to do. I had to figure out, was I feeding flesh or was I feeding my spirit more? Because what I was doing was inundating my mind and my, my eyes with who I'm, what I'm watching on TV, movies, pretty much can't watch anything on HBO, Music, who am I following on social media? Because all that was doing was feeding sexuality. It was feeding my flesh. And this goat grew way bigger than my spirit goat. And then I wonder, every time that we're in a battle, why would this one win? Because I was feeding it constantly. If you know what I was feeding my spirit? About a 30 second prayer before I went to bed every night and maybe 45 minutes of a preacher preaching on Sunday and that's it. Well, no wonder when my spirit and flesh were in conflict and waging war against my soul, would my flesh win every time? So what I had to do was I had to start being very intentional about what I was going to feed in my life. Now, I'm not going to let you women off the hook because I understand that that trends masculine, but not always. But let me ask you this. Negativity, bitterness, unforgiveness, gossip, hatred, anger. Which one are you feeding? If 
you were to take all of your thoughts within a 24-hour cycle, minus six to eight when, when you sleep, because some crazy things happen in your sleep, you don't need to, you dream of stuff. I dreamed yesterday, literally, <laughs> that I was hanging out with Stephen Furtick, and that snakes were trying to attack us, and I was saving Stephen Furtick from snakes. Why? I had no idea! So that doesn't count as my thoughts. I'm sure he's watching, Pastor Stephen Furtick. You're welcome. But if I took your thoughts of how many you have in a 24-hour cycle, which one are you thinking about? Because social media is going to tell you and I what we're not, what we don't have. And so if we're thinking with social media and we're inundating our brains and we're feeding that of, I'm not as skinny as that person, I don't have as good of a marriage as that person, I don't have as nice of a house, as nice of a spouse, as nice of a car, I don't have this, I don't have that, I'm not this, I'm not that, you are feeding your flesh, you are feeding the things that are not of God, and it's very easy to, when you, when you start entering this season and you can feel it like a storm coming on the front of anxiety or depression or anger or resentment and you're like, why can't I ever get victories in my head over this thing is because you are feeding that goat a whole lot more than this goat. What you feed grows. I want to hear for a moment, I want you to hear what Paul says in Romans. This is Romans 8. This is a very... Uh, famous is probably the wrong word, familiar portion of scripture. But don't let your familiarity with it breed indifference. This is the living word of God. And don't be so audacious to think, I already know this. I don't need to listen anymore. God may reveal something new to you today if you've heard this 50 times. If it's your first time, oh man, Romans 8 is a fantastic chapter. Verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. That's a, that's a strong word, even stronger in the Greek. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh, listen to this phrase, this is huge, cannot please God. Did you hear that? If you are living in the realm of the flesh, in your mind, you cannot please God. But the opposite of that is true. If your mind can be in the spirit, then it pleases God. I want you to hear the rest of this. Verse 9. So then Paul reminds everybody who they are. He's got this amazing way with the way he writes. It's called the chiastic structure. It comes from the letter X in Greek. And he'll, he'll go in and give you something and then work his way the same way back out and then start from the top. And it makes this letter X. And he always puts the encouragement at the forefront. And then he gives you, like, that's why when you read Paul, you're like, man, this is a verbal spanking. Okay, he's telling me who I am. And we're exiting with another verbal spanking. Uh, Mark uses this in his Gospels. It's called the Mark and Sandwich. He does the same thing. Have you ever heard of, like, uh, uh, take uh, criticism but sandwich it with two compliments? Same idea. Verse 9. So this is him telling you. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. You are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death and sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Can I get an amen? And he who raised Christ from the dead will also give your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. This should echo the same things of he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than any outside influence that can have an effect on you. The Spirit that is in you, we underestimate the power of having the Holy Spirit in us. So for those of you that are sitting here right now and you're stuck in this, this rocking chair, hamster wheel of losing these battles to your flesh, you are underestimating the power of what the Spirit can do. No one had to tell me to stop sinning when I fell in love with Jesus. No one had to tell me a magic algorithm to get sin out of my life other than spend more time with Jesus. But which goat are you feeding? 
Verse 12, therefore, my brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit you put into, sorry, let me read that again. Reading's hard. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those of you who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. I just got back from vacation. It was fantastic. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and my wife and I came to a realization while we were on vacation that my kids are conservative, 80-year-old, no offense, small Baptist women <laughs> trapped in an 8- and 10-year-old body. <laughs> they are. So we go to the bowling alley, I told you this earlier, and the people sitting next to me, I'm just talking, and my kids go, they walk up and they invite them to church. And I'm like, why didn't I invite them to church? But, but we were driving and we did what y'all do. Well, some of you. We had a playlist going as we were driving because we were driving all the way to the Outer Banks. Long drive. Also, bad time to plan a cross-country driving trip with gas, $12 a gallon right now. I'm a preacher, we embellish. But, but it was a bad time. But we're, pl- we're, we're, we're listening to this playlist and every time that there's like some sort of cuss word or for some reason my youngest daughter thinks the word sexy is a cuss word, that every time any one of those, she does not like track two on your album, Eric. Let me tell you what, she does not. But every time that she, <laughs> every time that she hears one of those, she does this. She goes, ah! <clears throat> and I hear my oldest daughter, she's like, she's like, hey, you... You need to turn this, Dad. This ain't good. And I didn't even notice. And, and I'm sitting there, and then I tell my wife, I'm like, dude, we, we raised some little prudes. Really? <laughs> like, my kids are judgmental. <laughs> Who are you telling me what I can't listen to? <laughs> and then my oldest daughter, she, she, she tries to make me feel better. And she said, well, well Dad... If it's a country song, it's okay if they say the D or the A word because it's just part of country music. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, good, honey, turn it up. No, no. But then they're in this other room at this Airbnb that we had and they're watching, you know, we let them have a little bit of media when we're on vacation and they're watching it and I hear my oldest tell my youngest, hey, we should probably turn that, not watch that. And I hear all of this and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, like, I'm just a normal person like y'all. When it comes to parenting, like I'm a C student, all right? How did I get kids that I'm like, yeah, that's right. My kids know to turn the channel when it's not good. Yeah, that's right. They're inviting people to church. Yeah, that's right. These songs that have just some cuss words in it, and it's only the D and the A word, and it's country music, which is, I guess, fine. But, but why does it bother them, and I don't even notice it, and I figured it out? It's not because I'm an amazing parent. It's because my wife and I have been very, very intentional to raise them in an environment where the spirit is always fed. What are your kids watching? What are you watching while your kids are in the room? Jeremy spoke two weeks ago, great message, and I loved what he said at the end. He said, your kids aren't going to remember your words nearly as much as they're going to remember your actions. So if you tell them how you have faith in God, if you tell them how faithful you are, but they don't see it, you're going to actually do damage because they're going to be raised up and they're going to be like, I'm not going to church, it's full of hypocrites. My parents said this, they didn't do that. I hope that burns a little bit. How did we raise our kids in the spirit? It's really not that complicated. At the very beginning, we were just very intentional about setting up some things. So here's what we did. My kids are at church all the time, all the time. And the Crowleys have done an amazing job with that children's ministry back there. And my wife has done an amazing job. I think I'm a little biased raising the nursery up there and our students and my kids are here all the time. And so they are constantly being inundated with things of the spirit. We cut out some music and, uh, and listened to a lot of worship music. I, had, I told you a while ago, I had to cut out 
things in my life that, man, it was not easy looking at my friends and being like, dude, I can't watch that anymore. Why? Because I'm not strong enough to. A little embarrassing. My kids fall asleep every single night to Bible stories on their echo. And then my wife has set up this habit that they've been doing now for two years where they have their own children's devotional that they read every single morning before they go to school. What am I feeding in my kid's life? Am I showing them the self-centeredness, get whatever you want right away over and over again? Or are we feeding them in the spirit? Because what you feed grows. And if these two things are at war, most of the time in nature, biggest thing wins. You want victory? What are you feeding? Let's pivot for a moment. And let me show you about two other goats in your life. And this one is a little more practical. Did you know that you guys are control freaks? Some of you more than others. I'm a control freak too. You want to know why? Because I'm human. Think about all the times in your life where things weren't in your control anymore. I don't know if you've ever lost a job abruptly. I have. My boss and I had a huge disagreement. I wanted to be employed there. And he didn't. <laughs> For some reason, we just couldn't get past that. But I panicked. Why? Because all of a sudden, I'm like, I don't know where my next dollar is going to come from. I don't know what this looks like. I don't know. And, and, and us moving here a year and a half ago was like, oh, I, don't, I can't do this. I don't know about that. I don't know this. Some of you will not fly in an aeroplane because you're a control freak. No offense. Some of you will not let your wife drive because you're a control freak or because you're smart because Adam Carmen can't drive. <laughs> and if it makes you feel any better, I would ride in a car with you driving over a car that Casey Sasser is driving every single day of the week. <laughs> Casey, when you're driving, you can't talk to the person next to you while looking in both of their eyes at all times. You can't. <laughs> this one's faith. Control and faith. These are the other set of goats that you have in your life. We got flesh and spirit, and that's the one we spent most of our time on. But I want, I want to touch this real quick because I want to grow in my faith. I do. And, 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 and sometimes in church or like in preacher world, they make it sound like you either have faith or you don't. They do. And I'm like, dude, where do I get it? Is it on sale? What aisle is it on? Where do I get faith? Because I hear phrases like in Hebrews, it is without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I want to please God. I want to have faith. How do I do it? And, and here's the real answer is there's not a one-time elixir for it. It's a goat that you got to feed. And as you feed it, it grows. And then when fear comes in because you don't have control anymore, you're not as worried about it because the faith goat is way bigger than the control goat. Now we say fear, but what is fear? Fear is really, I don't have control over this situation, so I'm afraid. But control is fool's gold. Do you have control? Are you controlling if your heart is beating right now? Are you controlling all of the different variables in life that could literally like make you meet Jesus in two seconds? What do you have control over? And I want you to hear this portion of scripture in which we see a little bit of Jesus' real emotions. So you think of Jesus as like this, you know, he's, he's, he's always in control and he's talking like this and he just has, you know, but that, that wasn't Jesus. You just have to be able to sift through the emotions. And the honest truth is, is that in the, the English translation of the Greek, it's hard because English is an inferior language to Greek. But I want you to hear this. Now, we're going to be in the uh, Mark's gospel, but I want to give you a little bit of a setup for a moment. So this is right after Jesus fed the 4,000, all right? He fed the 4,000 with a number four from Long John Silvers, and he fed, he fed 4,000 people. Some of you will get that later. That's a good joke. And, and he fed 4,000 people, and right after this miracle, the Pharisees, the religious teachers, the pastors, the people were, were always asking Jesus gotcha questions. 
seeing if he would contradict himself, seeing if he would stumble over his words, or seeing if they could trap him, which would eventually lead to his crucifixion. And and I want you to hear this. So he just fed the 4,000. We're in Mark 8. It's just two verses. We're almost done. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. And they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply. If you write in your Bible, underline that phrase in verse 12, or just pay attention to it. And he said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given. Why does this generation ask for a sign? Now, that phrase I told you about there, that's in verse 12, where it says, he sighed deeply. I want you to hear this. This is an incredibly rare phrase in Greek. It starts with the letter A. I'm not going to pretend like I can pronounce it, but it's an incredibly rare word in Greek that represents the phrase, sigh deeply. Uh, one, one translation says he was grieved in spirit. Here's what's so rare about that, is that you actually, that's the only time that that one particular word appears in the entire New Testament. One time! On top of that, that word actually only appears in roughly 30 different parts of Greek literature out of all of it. It's a very rare word. And again, remember, we talked about the Markin sandwich where he's trying to point something out to you, yeah? So he has a, a miracle. Following that is another miracle. And then what we talked about is this phrase of Jesus right here. It's his way of putting it on a pedestal and saying, look right here. And what it means is Jesus is saying this. He's, he's, a better translation is that he is grieved. He is moved. He is feeling discouraged. And here's why. Let's end it with this. Because in the Western church in 2022, we underestimate the importance of faith to God. Did you hear that? Of course you did. I yell. We underestimate the importance of faith to God. Let's put this in a human perspective for a moment. I've been married for, oh, I shouldn't have said that on the fly, I think 16 years. <laughs> Sorry, it changes every year. But, <laughs> but here's the thing. I want you to put yourself in my wife's situation for a minute. Now, that's going to be scary, especially for you men. But I want to put you in my wife's place for just a moment. Imagine if I told her, Every time you go to work, I need proof that you're at work. Every time you say you go to the store, I got to know that you get to the, went to the store because you better not be talking to anybody else. I better see every dollar that you spend. You better turn that receipt in the second that you get home. You better show me evidence that you love me every single day. What kind of marriage would that be? My wife would say, you don't trust me. What kind of relationship is that? And I think that's what Jesus is trying to point out right here for us, is he's trying to say, you were always asking for a sign. They would follow because they wanted to see a miracle and they would ask him all the time, prove that you are the son of God. Have you ever been in that season of your life where you're like, I don't know if God's real. He's not answering my prayers. Have you ever said this phrase? And I have many times. Show me that you're real, God. Show me evidence that this is what you want me to do. Show me, because I've been praying for this for weeks and you haven't answered. God, show me that you're real. What an entry-level relationship that is with the person who's called you by name. When you put it in a human relationship, all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, of course. I know my wife loves me. You know how I know? Because the evidence is all around. If I look. With Jesus, let me ask you this. Are you feeding control? Or are you feeding faith? That's why, why giving is so unnatural. The preacher only wants your money, right? Why would I tithe? That, 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 that is so unnatural for me to give my money and give it over to God. Because you've bought into the lie that you control your finances. Rather than trusting that God has it and that God wants better for you than you want. What do we do with 
with our, our time. The reality is we're fixing to go two services and some of you still aren't serving anywhere. We need you. Why? Because I don't have enough time. I'm going to have control over it. Now, don't worry. I'm not passing the offering plate back around unless you want me to, <laughs> but I don't plan to. What about with your time? I'm not, I'm not going to submit this area to my life because I want control. And then what happens is when we face a moment of crisis, we panic and we worry and we stress and we can't sleep at night and we can't get over it because our faith isn't strong enough because we haven't been feeding it. You want to feed your faith before you go through the crisis. Have you ever been around somebody who's been walking with God for a long time and has been feeding faith for decades? And you're like, bro, nothing phases you. Why? Why? Oh, it's because their faith goat is way, way, way bigger than the control goat. About, I didn't tell him I was going to do this, but I want to, and I have a microphone. About a, a year and a half ago, Gerald and Martha both got COVID. And I was super concerned for Gerald because he's like 110. And, but he got COVID and like he's got some breathing problems and and he was very very sick and I had COVID at the same time and I knew I was very very sick and I'm built like Atlas like a Greek god and if I was struggling with it that's not funny I was really worried for Gerald and so I would call Gerald and we would talk almost every day and I was more worried for Gerald than Gerald was why because for decades He's been feeding his faith goat. So when problems arise and things go on that you didn't anticipate, it doesn't bother him because he knows he's not in control. Which goat are you feeding? Now finally, let's end it with this. If you haven't ever given your life to the Lord, then the Spirit of God is not in you. You can never have peace. You can never have faith. Because the first step is to give your life to the Lord. But for those of you that want control, and for those of you that have to have evidence that God is real, I want you to hear this. Evidence bypasses faith. I'm going to say it again so you can retweet it. Evidence bypasses faith. These two are at war for the future of your relationship with God. Which goat are you feeding? Would you stand with me? So we're going to pray, and then we're going to come back in. I think we're playing evidence. I hope so, because I lobbed a softball for our worship team here to end it with this. But what I love about this is I see the evidence of your goodness all around me, all over my life. If you are breathing, you have a purpose. Some of you have tried so many times to mess up God using you, yet you're still here. Congratulations, you're not powerful enough to mess up the call of God on your life. You cannot use it. But the word of Ephesians says he set those things ahead of time. Ahead of time. So don't let the enemy trick you into thinking you don't have a purpose anymore. You're too old for that, or you've done your time. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, we need you here. Your work needs you. Your neighbors need you. Your family needs you. You were made on purpose and for a purpose. During this last song, we have two different deacons and their families on each side of the stage. They are here to pray with you. If you want to know more about what it's like to give your life to the Lord, they can lead you in that. If you have somebody in your life that you want to do what's called intercessory prayer, which means you are praying on their behalf, whether they're here or not, that's what this time is for. And if you don't need it, that's okay too. But I want to do this as a body of Christ, and let's worship one more time. And when we're done, that's when church starts. Let's end this together, church.